Hello and welcome to this Business Council for Sustainable Development Australia webinar. My name is Andrew Peterson and I'm the CEO of the Business Council for Sustainable Development Australia and welcome to this conversation on a new topic for BCSD Australia around the nexus of business, health and planetary well-being. Today I'm joined by two colleagues, uh, Moira Estefanu and Regina uh, Jobson who have been working with Business Council for Sustainable Development Australia in a uh, intern role, research intern role, for the last few months on this important project. Today, we're going to be walking through uh, the findings of a survey and a report that we have prepared in relation to those survey findings. In opening this webinar, I would like to acknowledge that the uh, report and the broadcast today is being brought to you from the land of the traditional owners of the Camaragal people. And we acknowledge their elders past, present and emerging. As I indicated, this is a new phase of work that we have commenced at BCSD Australia in relation to our equity Ac action program, and in particular on people and society. What we're going to be walking you through today uh, uh, some outlines in relation to why we've taken this particular piece of work, this research, what the information has told us uh, in relation to international insights on this issue. And then we're going to share with you a, a survey that we've been undertaking over the last few weeks in relation to Australian reflections on the issues that we've been identified in these particular pieces of research. Then we're going to give you a quick insight into what we think are the important conclusions from those uh, survey insights, and then also give you a glimpse into what we're going to be doing as a result of the information that we've been able to glean. So firstly, the reason why we're looking at this is a question of how the world is embracing the challenge of not just sustainability per se, but the health inequalities that uh, have emerged as a result of COVID-19. It may come as some surprise to be talking about COVID-19, uh, what, a year and a half, possibly two years even, after the um, uh, way in which COVID has been affecting our lives. But there's some important insights and data that have been emerging on the global uh, landscape of what the implications of these inequalities are for work and consumption, particularly as they're un undergoing a form of significant transformation that have been accelerated by the COVID pandemic. So uh, in particular, we've been focused on what the consumer attitudes towards sustainability have been as a result of the shift uh, post pandemic, uh, identifying that there in fact, we think is a gap that exists between the desire for change and the action that is being in fact taken. And interestingly, we would like to show you how Australian consumers, we think at the moment at least, are less willing to pay more for products or brands than improve, that improve society and the environment than perhaps their international colleagues. In the same way, we think that the role of the employee post pandemic has also begun to shift. And it's an interesting piece of work that has been undertaken by the World Business Council for Sustainable Development that we'd like to share with you and give you our thoughts as a result of the survey results that give some important indicators of what business in Australia thinks about the role of the employee post pandemic. So in that regard, let's move on to the context of this information. And it's insightful that there have been a number of call outs over the last, it's certainly the last 12 to 18 months in relation to, as we say, the intersection of global change, health inequalities, uh, and the future of work and consumption. And in that regard, the question as to why we're looking at this is twofold. The first is, well, why health and uh, well-being is an important matter to the role of sustainable development. Well, for those of you who know anything about the WBCSD and in particular BCSD Australia, we think that they are important issues around the expectation of a global uh, community 
committing to the Sustainable Development Goals. And in this regard, we're looking at and focusing on three goals in particular. That's SDG 3 of health and wellbeing, SDG 8 of decent work and economic growth, and particularly as a result of both of those goals, SDG 10 and reduced inequality. Now, you might ask yourself, well, why, why does Australia have to worry about these particular aspects? Well, it's interesting when you d uh, dive into not just um, health, health and wellbeing data in Australia, and for those of you who are watching this live will understand that only in the last 24 hours, we've seen important data from the government in relation to its own wellbeing report, but also consumer attitudes in relation to post-pandemic cost of living challenges starting to actually change. But what, quite importantly, um, UN information telling us that the Australian circumstance in relation to health and wellbeing is actually one of the goals that we're not achieving. So that there are challenges for the Australian economy that as a result of the Australian society, not actually focusing on this particular issue. And in relation to the challenge that it means for business, well, in any circumstance where there's a lack of productivity or there's a lack of engagement or there's a lack of um, interest by a key stakeholder, you will find that business is challenged and it becomes a risk for business if there are uh, the operating system in which uh, consumption and production is not working at peak and optimum um, circumstance will be a real um, problem for business. So in that regard, the challenge of health and wellbeing for business has the manifest drivers, particularly in the Australian circumstance, of the need to stay uh, ahead of the involving regulatory environment. And we're seeing this quite, uh, quite starkly at the moment. In relation to the issue of talent acquisition and retention, it becomes real in an economic environment where unemployment is at an all time low. The challenge that the investor um, community is looking at the operation of business in an ESG world and therefore how business accesses capital to grow becomes important. The reputation and brand value of, a partic of particular companies in the marketplace to attract talent, but also to undertake the productivity that it does becomes important if it as a sector or as an industry, or for that matter, as an individual company is not highly prized in the market. And then finally, just the uh, overall resilience of a business in a market where cost of living is a challenge, the post pandemic questions of, ability, of the ability of people to rather work from home rather than come into community of staff and colleagues, are all issues that are germane to the operation of business. So what we undertook was a uh, interesting uh, analysis of recent reports, not only from the World Health Organization and the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, but these reports we think highlight some stark health inequalities that have been exacerbated by COVID-19. Various marginalized groups are emerging, including not only the poor, ethnic minorities and low paid workers, as they have been disproportionately impacted, particularly because of COVID. The findings, I think, challenge us as a society, certainly us as business. And for that matter, governments are clearly grappling with them at the moment. Why? Because they need to understand how to take a more inclusive approach to health and wellbeing. So it raises questions of accountability in addressing these particular disparities. The OECD report for, for uh, calling out that particular report actually emphasizes the need for recovery plans to improve job quality, uh, particularly for vulnerable groups and calls for policy options to ensure groups have skills for future jobs, addressing discrimination and providing equal opportunity. This is particularly true at the moment where the planet is looking at how it decarbonizes in a effective, robust and efficient way. We then move on to the WHO report, which emphasizes the need to consider social determinants in pandemic preparedness and response efforts. Now these particular determinants that it calls out, including conditions of birth, work, growth, 
living and aging, as well as the access to power, to money and resources significantly, and in particular since COVID, has influenced health inequalities across the planet. What that means for Australian business is that as it faces the risk of decreased productivity, and we're hearing a lot about that at the moment, and an increased potential for turnover if job quality and security for vulnerable people uh, and workers is not addressed, they may also have to face reputational risk if they don't take the steps to support equal opportunity addressing things like discrimination. Now, in that regard, we've looked at two other pieces of data that have come through in the last 18 months. The first is the GlobeScan report uh, titled The Health and Sustainable Living Project, which actually came uh, out in late 2022. But this uh, program of work has actually been undertaken ever since 2019. So it's an interesting opportunity to look at the attitudes of the consumer in this particular case prior to COVID and now data collected post COVID. This global initiative is aimed at understanding and engaging consumers, particularly on the issue of sustainability. Now on the 22, 2022 study, they involved nearly 30,000 interviews across 31 markets, including Australia, and assessed consumers' actions towards an environmentally healthy future. And you're going to hear more about the uh, results in just a moment of what they mean to Australia. The research builds on GlobeScan's uh, two decades of expertise in sustainability and was supported by a consortia of companies, including IKEA, Levi Strauss, and the NGO, the WWF. The insights from this study, we think, provide valuable guidance for business to better align with consumer expectations on sustainability. So what were the 22 findings? Well, the cost of living crisis worldwide is clearly impacting customers' ability to lead healthy and sustainable lifestyles because of soaring inflation. The global concern about climate change is, interestingly, still at an all-time high, with a majority of parents reporting their children's worry about environmental problems. So we're seeing that coming through from the family. Despite a slow increase in sustainable behaviours since, uh, since the pandemic, a gap currently exists between the desire for major lifestyle change and significant change taken. Consumers are also receptive to information about sustainable products. Uh, and what's interesting, and we're going to dive into this in relation to Australia, is this question of trust within the environmental products that these, or the benefits rather, of these products have for the consumer and what the consumer thinks about that. Unfortunately, we're only seeing that about half believe that uh, people that live sustainable lifestyles will do so within the coming decade. And this is troubling when you consider how governments need to mobilise, uh, educate, create awareness and build capacity within communities for things like uh, decarbonisation if they, they, they themselves don't see that they're going to be living in a form of a, uh, in a sustainable lifestyle within the next decade. So let's move on to the Australian findings. And we'll do so by clicking the button, Andrew. Now, this um, information, uh, interestingly, oh, need to go and find the information, uh, also was taken at its same time as that of the global information. Now, what it tells us are the following points, that Australian consumers have a willingness to pay for products or brands that improve society and environment. But that attitude seems to have declined. And we want to um, understand that further and we'll talk about that later. Yet, a good 49% of those interviewed, uh, or responded rather, uh, recently, at least in the time period of the survey, purchased eco-friendly or environmentally friendly products. So that's still a high margin, even though uh, compared particularly to the Asia-Pacific region, Australia is actually at the lowest level. There seems to be a strong belief that government's role 
towards a sustainable future among Australians is critical. And we'll come to that in our own survey results shortly. One really interesting standout was that driving an electric car is seen as a sustainable activity. We might pause for thought in relation to what that means in terms of policy in, in the, the Australian circumstance. Post pandemic, the Australian behaviour of uh, environmental or sustainable lifestyles has clearly shifted due to elevated food prices, increased health concerns, and more, and the desire rather for more family time. Now, that's an interesting one because, in one sense, it's actually a sustainable lifestyle by slowing down, engaging but very concerned about cost of living. So the key takeaway for us is that the post-pandemic shift in environmental attitudes, the belief in sustainability, fueling gradual behaviour, and the importance of identifying trusted resources for a sustainable future, those bedrocks are there, but they are not at such a level that you would say that the bulk of the Australian uh, community or the consumer particularly is seeing that as a game changer in terms of sustainable lifestyles into the future. Let's now uh, pivot to the uh, employee. And in that regard, in 2021, the WBCSD, the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, released its Vision 2050 uh, Time to Transform report, which was a framework aimed at elevating global health and wellbeing standards aligning with Sustainable Development Goal number three. Now, the health pe uh, Healthy People and Healthy Business report that you see on the screen was a 2022, late 2022 report uh, as a result of a collaborative effort between 23 of the WBCSD member companies that underscores the pivotal role that business is playing in achieving sustainable healthy outcomes. Now, this is instructive. The report itself presents 13 case studies from business that identify concrete opportunities for business to enhance their global health impact, protect and to promote and where possible nurture health within and beyond their own corporate boundaries. Now, why would you do that? You might uh, quite rightly ask. Well, the challenge for business as the WBCSD in this report identified is that it can and must have a role in fostering a healthy and well-being circumstance within their own organisation so that they can enhance productivity, they can ensure that there's high morale and that there is an overall well-being amongst all staff and employees uh, overall, which includes the C-suite and, and, um, and the boards as a matter of interest. Now, in that regard, companies from this, uh, identified from this report, companies can support healthy consumer lifestyles, but also encourage responsible and sustainable employee engagement that leads to healthy outcomes with, uh, as a result, with a healthy planet. So business in this um, report has identified what we call the multifaceted approach for business, being these four elements of embedding culture of health and wellbeing into the workplace, supporting and enabling a healthy consumer lifestyle, because that's for a lot of business B2C, but in, of course, in the B2B world, your, uh, your B is actually a C. And uh, in relation to the other three, strengthening health systems, so supporting the active work of both physical and mental health care in key countries in which you operate, and then finally, the overall responsibility of accelerating climate, nature and equity, recognising, as it says, the interconnectedness of health and environmental sustainability. So in this report, we see an action framework that's been called out, and I won't uh, go into any great detail, but it identifies that as a result of the key responsibility of business towards employees, there are actions that can be taken that strengthen and create resilience for the business uh, operation into the future as a result of focusing on health and wellbeing. Now let's turn to the survey. And in this regard, I'm going to ask Moira and Regina if they'll come back online. 
and welcome them both into this conversation as a result of the work that they've been undertaking with BCSD Australia around the development of this survey and then putting it out into the field. So this survey was uh, conducted over a two week period from the 11th to the 24th of July, and we hope is a comprehensive effort to gather some valuable insights from a broad spectrum of respondents. We received over 97 responses, each one contributing to a deeper understanding of the impact of significant events, particularly COVID-19 and the in impact of that and now increasingly other uh, economic forces on society. Our first goal was to delve into the uh, pandemic's influence on the Australian consumer and the Australian employee circumstance, because we were interested in understanding both the GlobeScan uh, data and its relevance to Australia, as well as the WBCSD insight and whether it also applied here. The second goal of the survey has been to identify the key factors that influence the shift in these attitudes and the barriers that are currently hindering progress. And the third and final goal was to emphasize and understand the role that business has as an input into contributing to an effective response for a society in relation to this issue. So in that regard, we undertook these uh, survey questions, uh, eight of them in total. And what we might do is kick off both with, uh, uh, firstly with Regina, looking at the first question and walking us through both the question and also giving us some um, high level um, insights as to the results of that particular question. So Regina, over to you. Thanks, Andrew. Our first survey question was, which factors currently impacting global health are the biggest concern for your business? And uh, the importance of mental health received the highest response rate for this at roughly 67%. Um, it's interesting, these findings uh, were very much affirmed in the WBCSD report, as well as other data points that we reviewed in preparing for this. Um, the results of our survey, we believe, demonstrate the importance of businesses integrating mental health support into their workplace policies. And uh, we provided some examples in our key takeaway section about some potential pro, um, programs or services um, that can be implemented by businesses to support employees and uh, their workers overall. Um, the question responses also demonstrate um, that infectious diseases continue to remain a top concern. Uh, they received a little over 44% of the response rate, as well as uh, access to safe water, sanitation, and hygiene was also shown to be uh, very important, receiving just over 33% of our responses. And for both of those factors as well, we've included um, some examples of how businesses can work to implement policies or services um, to support employees and consumers um, as necessary. Next slide. Thank you, Regina. All right, now let's um, welcome in Moira. And Moira, if you'd like to share with us question number two and the key insights that that's yielded. Uh, for question two, uh, which health-based strategies do you think can support improvements to consumer lifestyles and contribute to a healthier society and more sustainable future? So uh, most of the responses from Australian businesses was about 44% and it was focused on incentives, policy standards, workplace uh, wellness, community engagement, advocacy and training. And this should be considered by uh, Australian businesses. And what came next was 33% for health equity and effective leadership and equitable access to healthcare services should be considered. And five responses were 22% each, and um, which is collaboration of healthcare professionals, sustainability practices, technology use, and collaboration with educational institutions. Next, please. For question three, um, what actions do you believe Australian consumers prior prioritize the most in their pursuit for a sustainable future? So the top response was 
eco-friendly packaging and it was very highly valued and the suggested plan for the Australian uh, businesses is to attract consumers making purchasing decisions and what came next was renewable energy and ethical sourcing, which was 44%, and uh, enhancing brand reputation and appeal to consumers um, was one of the suggested strategies. Uh, for holistic sustainable practices, it was 33%, and uh, businesses can show comprehensive commitment to uh, consumers, and that will help a lot. Uh, next, please. For question four, according to the GlobeScan Healthy and Sustainable Living Survey 2022, there has been a noticeable shift in Australian consumers' attitudes towards the environment and preference for eco-friendly products. And our takeaways found that uh, the availability of eco-friendly products was the main one, which is 77%, and marketing here should be considered by businesses. And what came next was recognition of impact and corporate initiatives, and it was like 55% and sustainability strategies and health communication is suggested for businesses and 44% of responses showed more awareness uh, for future generation and social media and policy changes. And uh, it should be considered the government initiatives by businesses. Next, please. In your view, which institutions do you believe Australian consumers trust to make informed decisions and drive progress towards a sustainable future. And uh, the first thing was the national government. On national levels, so, uh, uh, Australian businesses consider partnerships and they should know how significant is the impact on the process uh, of national government because it's the most trusted by the Australian consumers. And uh, what came next is the state level of government and NGOs and businesses. And this is uh, um, a big influence in partnerships uh, of their role. And what came last is the academic uh, institutions and research. UN, uh, United Nations, OECD, and community approaches. So multi-stakeholders approaches uh, should be considered by businesses. Next, please. Back to you, Regina. Yes, uh, question six asks, what key factors do you believe significantly drive uh, productivity among employees? And we did ask our survey participants to select their top five responses for this. Um, again, it was interesting to see that our survey findings supported many of the themes found within the WBCSD report, as well as our broader um, data research that we performed. Um, the highest percentage of survey responses were for uh, maintaining a work-life balance and employee well-being initiatives. Um, that was around 56%. Um, some possible action items that we've um, reviewed in our takeaways included um, potentially initiating flexible workplace um, policies or different wellness programs. And uh, for our second and third highest responses, it was interesting. There were a number of ties between our possible answers, including opportunities for skill development and career growth, a collaborative and uh, teamwork environment, as well as empowerment and autonomy in decision making. Those each received um, around 44% of response rates. And then lastly, access to necessary resources, confidence in the company's future, and effective leadership, um, each received around 33% of responses, which, and we've really highlighted some opportunities uh, for businesses to uh, take advantage of, um, of these findings in our, uh, in our takeaway section. Uh, next, please. Question seven asks, uh, what do you consider to be the most significant barriers impacting employee productivity? Again, top five options were requested. Um, 
no surprise, um, you know, the trend that we definitely saw throughout these surveys, the findings were very much, again, in line with the Healthy People, Healthy Business Report um, from the WBCSD, as well as um, the OC, OECD and uh, WHO, um, as we, uh, again, sought to, to find some overlining uh, trends um, for this report. Um, the WBCSD, for example, argues that business performance and a healthy and engaged workforce um, is very much intertwined and necessary for increased uh, productivity in the workplace. And that was uh, reiterated in our responses as well. Um, we found that inadequate training and development opportunities um, received the highest response rate at just over 66%. Um, mental health and work-life balance each received around 44% of responses and ineffective communication and collaboration, micromanagement or lack of autonomy and poor management um, or leadership practices uh, each received around 33% of responses. Uh, within our key takeaway section, we've outlined um, some potential opportunities businesses can take in response to these findings, for example, investing in employee training and development programs, promoting a healthy work-life balance, and then uh, lastly, improving employee satisfaction and productivity. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, for question eight, this was our last survey question. Uh, this asks, what type of incentives or rewards do you believe are most effective in driving increased productivity in the workplace? Um, around 56% of respondents, our highest uh, response rate selected a supportive and inclusive company culture, um, opportunities for career advancement and professional growth, employee wellness programs and initiatives, as well as employee stock options or profit sharing plans. Those each received around 44% of responses, um, fle flexible work arrangements. Uh, meaningful and challenging work assessments, assignments, excuse me, and additional paid time off or vacation benefits, um, those received around 33% each. So fairly um, even evenly scored for those, all uh, very popular as well. And, and these did keep in theme with a lot of the uh, these survey questions um, with what we have seen with the WBCSD report. And again, our broader research that so was very encouraging to see um, our findings to be uh, confirmed within uh, the BCSDA. Uh, findings as well. Uh, within our own key takeaway sections, we've outlined the importance of these findings as a means for businesses to attract and retain employees while also Im improving employee satisfaction and overall health and well-being in the workplace. And thanks. That's it. Thanks, Regina. So Regina and Mara, don't go away. Question of a question without notice to both of you. Mm -hmm. I'd be interested in your reaction to the results in the two areas in which you worked. I mean, we, we have written a report as to the findings as a result of the survey, but I'd be interested in your reflections as to what you expected and what you actually saw and what, what perhaps surprised you about the outcomes of the survey results. Who would like to go first? Being a bit cheeky here. I can go. So, all right, all right, go for it. Uh, what I expected is that um, the awareness of Australian consumers uh, was very high and the availability of eco-friendly products, I was expecting that. But the surprising thing, very surprising for me that Australian businesses choose the last thing for research and educational institutions as like the last option. So um, that was very surprising because I was believing this was the first thing they think about. So I think they believe in action and taking action first. And uh, actually the government trust um, differs between countries. So Australia uh, trusts more national governments. Other parts of the world, globally, uh, they trust, their level of trust is uh, arranged in a certain way, like different ways. Mm. Yeah. So that's what I noticed, yeah. Yeah, no, that, that, that is an interesting observation. And there's been a lot of assessment of where trust of government has gone during COVID. And I think Edelman's trust barometer over the last couple of years, particularly for Australia, is, is indicated and may have something to do with an election as well. I'm not quite sure, but it has reinstated government rather than business as the most trusted source of um, 
uh, or the most trusted institutions, probably the right way to express it, in relation to being able to affect change, which comes quite um, quite a difference from the last perhaps what even ten years of Edelman assessment. So that yeah, it's an interesting call out. Thank you. And Regina, what what did you learn from the um, not just the WBCSD report, but also the survey information that we gleaned when we asked about uh, business about the employee circumstance? Sure. Um, actually, for me, probably the first question um, was was surprising for me, not so much in the highest um, uh, response. I, I actually rather expected that mental health um, would would get that high percentage, and indeed it did. And as you kind of mentioned, it was already um, confirmed in the reports and, and as, as probably many listening to this as well know that it is and it continues to be, um, you know, a very important global point. But um, it was very interesting to me um, that infectious diseases um, uh, hit the 44% response rate that it did. I don't know that I expected it to be completely ignored, but especially with, as you kind of referenced, it's it's very easy and in perhaps some ways justified. We, we want to put the COVID-19 pandemic and, and, you know, the risk of infectious diseases very, very far behind us. Um, um because it was it was quite an ordeal of course but mm. um to see that that still remains a concern and and, and that extends beyond COVID-19 as well um but I think that that's very relevant um and and interesting that um from a business perspective that it still continues to be a priority it can only be assumed that employees prioritize this as well so that's good to see from a business perspective that that um, remains a concern, and it'll be interesting to see how um, different methodology services and programs are implemented, both in Australia as well as uh, globally. Mm. Yeah, well, the non-expert in me, and I'm I'm relying on you two to correct me if I'm wrong, but the non-expert in me says that the um, that that forty four percent and that sixty seven percent, in one sense, are correlated to each other because mm. um, the concerns of community, the concerns of business for that matter, in relation to a healthy workforce um, is not just the, the business leaders, but it's the employees as well. And it's the ability of uh, employees with families to be able to get to work, get to school, have uh, a pleasant lifestyle, whether you consider that to be sustainable or not. It's interesting that, as you say, that the tail end of COVID is actually quite a strong and thick tail at the moment because of the concern about the health consequences and therefore um, the, the mental health impacts that it's had, which then has another ripple effect into the ongoing um, crisis that the globe faces in relation to not just climate change, but certainly cost of living. And so, yeah. It'll be, it'll be interesting to see the next WHO report in relation to particularly mental health circumstances uh, as a result of now climate change, particularly in the Northern Hemisphere over the last couple of weeks, if not months, also bearing down on people's thoughts about what the future looks like. Yeah. So um, thank you for that. And thank you to both of you for your work uh, and role in bringing this to uh, fruition. I just wanted to, yes, highlight those key findings that we have gleaned. We found five. The first was um, the circumstances of mental health. And Regina, you're absolutely right. That, that, that number, 67% of respondents highlighting importance means that two thirds of them, 67, almost 67 people said that mental health was an important need for business to integrate um, or recognise that there needs to be an integration of mental health support into workplace policies. And we'll come, come to that um, in the way forward uh, because the, I think that's that's if it's the number one result, we need to do something about it. The second was, and this goes to Maura's point about Australian consumers prioritising the use of reusable and eco-friendly product packaging. And it's interesting, and maybe it's just because it's in the news at the moment, the conversation around single-use plastic, but it's in, again, it's interesting that it's stuck in the mind of business, that that's what consumers are saying is an important challenge that needs to be addressed. 
So uh, yeah, we'll see see from a policy and also business action point of view. The one that did surprise me was trust in institutions. I must say, I did not think that there would be as such a high trust in institutions, but the fact that the national government did get again a 67% level of trust um, does indicate that the consumer in Australia wants to see action on a national level, not just in a state and a local level, but on a national level to respond to national challenges um, in relation to global, global circumstance. So uh, certainly a letter to the Prime Minister in relation to, well, we found that you need to do a lot more uh, is going to be uh, on his desk, hopefully in the next few weeks. The one uh, lower order, the, this issue of employee pro productivity, where factors of driving productivity, including work-life balance and employee well-being, um, particularly because, and this is the one that I found most amusing in one sense, is nobody wants to have a work anniversary or a cake anymore. And that goes to the issue of health and well-being. But I also suspect it's also a question of, and I don't say this flippantly, but mental health and well-being. People don't necessarily want to be reminded of their birthday um, as such of the circumstance of time, and, and I'm speaking from personal experience, can I tell you? But joke aside, I think that um, understanding what the drivers of productivity are rather than necessarily there as a historical checklist of what you should be doing to make a, an employee feel engaged really does have to be reappraised by business. And so this concept that came through in the survey results of skill development, career growth, collaboration and teamwork uh, even in circumstances of work from home is, I think, going to be a real uh, interesting way forward for business um, post, post, particularly post cost of living. And then the last, and it's related to the barriers of productivity, uh, we saw in that result, uh, what was the most significant barriers impacting product employee productivity were identified as inadequate training. So it's not so much you have to work harder and you have to work more hours and I have to see you, it's I have to give you the tools to be able to do more for necessarily less. And that's going to be an interesting uh, C-suite challenge going forward, particularly if in the new order post COVID, we don't have everybody in the office anymore. There'll have to be new forms of technology, new approaches and new mindsets in relation to how we engage people around productivity uh, particularly where the issue of mental health has to be taken into account and that challenge that was called out by the surveyor of poor work, uh, poor work-life balance. So that's going to be an interesting one. So in wrapping up, let me, um, let me just note briefly that um, I think what I've learned from this and I think that the results tell us that findings of this particular exploration um, of the post-pandemic landscape it really serves as a very powerful reminder of the interconnectedness of the global change of health inequities in the future of work and consumption. And in that regard, business really does have to not be just a, a bystander in this scenario, but it has to be a pivotal player that can drive a form of meaningful change in its own work environment, but can contribute to national circumstance and overall into the global um, community of change. I think that by embedding a culture of health and well-being in a workplace and supporting healthy consumer lifestyles, interestingly, businesses can actually contribute to a healthier, happy society, build resilience, but importantly for them, create long-term value as a result of being seen as a market leader or a employee leader of choice or having that social license to operate with the consumer. So I hope that the report will serve as a roadmap for business to navigate this particular landscape. And in that regard, so seizing some opportunities and drive the transformation to a sustainable future. In terms of way forward, um, there are a couple of um, exciting things that I can't talk about because we haven't um, finalized them yet, but one we can do is talk about a toolkit that we're going to be um, building for business to identify particular actions that they can embed in a culture of health and well-being within their workplace. So focusing on the employee, and I hope that we'll have an announcement in relation to the consumer very soon. Well, that's it for this particular webinar. Um, in this report, you will also find how we've come about 
to the way in which we've done this particular survey and all of the questions, uh, this potential survey responses and the particular rationale for each of the question has been laid out in our report. And I'll get to when that's going to be launched very shortly. A big thank you to both Moira and uh, Regina for their contribution in developing this report, undertaking the um, development of the survey and then crunching the numbers, as it's called, when uh, the survey results came out, because as you saw, it happened very quickly. We went from Monday to today, getting those numbers done. And I'm very, um, very grateful for both of you for helping us get that, um, get that over the line. So thank you very much. Um, this report will become available on our website in the next few hours, and you will be able to download and read its information. And we look forward to further conversation with you all around how you might uh, like to work with us at BCSD Australia on um, not just this particular work program, but all others. And if you have any questions, please reach out via our website uh, and um, contact us. And we're more than happy to talk further about how you as a business can be involved in our community of uh, not just national companies, but also as part of the global network of the WBCSD. But for now, thank you so much for joining us. I'm Andrew Peterson and a very good day to you. Bye for now.